Um, so really to summarize today's talk, um, we all know, having seen the last few presentations, that environmental issues are really at the forefront and are more prominent than ever before, um, even in the last year or even in the last few months. So with this, the detrimental effects of the construction industry have been brought to the forefront. So there's a lot of conversations about um, high embodied energy materials and, and the detrimental impact of, uh, on, on the planet, basically. So this presentation is about exploring the idea of a sustainable narrative in a commercial context. How do we persuade clients that sustainability is about more than meeting building regs or about more than paying a carbon tax you know, as required by the mayor or you know, how many solar panels we put on the roof? Um, it's about thinking about sustainability in a more holistic way. So firstly, um, my name's Ed Whitehead. I've been an architect at Walthiston for um, about five years now. And this is a picture of um, our team. And it's a rather niche activity, but as you can see, we like to get pictures taken of ourselves in uh, timber yards all across Europe. Um, it makes us happy to sort of be around the process of, um, of all the timber buildings being produced that, that we tend to design and build. Um, incidentally, this picture is taken in a yard in Shoreditch, um, which is where our practice has been for about 20 years now. And I, I think this is important to note because First and foremost, we're an urban practice, and over the last 20 years, we've had to deal with um, the issues that urban practices have to deal with, such as social housing, market housing, um, you know, office buildings, all, all these kind of normal commercial projects that many architects have to deal with. Um, so I think that's important because um, you know, that's what leads, if we can make have an impact on uh, these sort of commercial projects, we can really see the biggest impact across across the country and across the globe. Um, so as you can see, um, and as you've probably heard, uh, Walthiston are a practice that specialise in designing buildings which are built with mass timber. And this is a picture of um, a typical sort of cross-laminated timber lift shaft, actually. So maybe people are familiar with what cross-laminated timber is, but I'll just give you a brief, so brief overview of what it actually is. So. This, what this diagram shows is effectively a series of planks which are laminated together in perpendicular directions and then forced under pressure to form a huge piece of timber which um, spans about 18 metres by about 3.4 metres. Um, and what you end up with is a series of walls and floors which are clipped together with um, simple screws um, to form a sort of flat pack building. So as you can see, there's a moody shot taken in Dalston, one of our projects, of a piece of cross-laminated timber being winched into place uh, and then screwed into place with these sort of small electric drills that carpenters are used to using all the time. So the next question is, why is timber relevant today? So admittedly, this is quite a big slide, but you know how we think that CLT could be quite important in reducing carbon across the globe. So. If you imagine the idea that as a tree grows, it absorbs carbon. So for the first 30 years of a tree's lifespan, it tends to absorb carbon, and after that, it stops absorbing carbon. So wherever we have forests across the globe, forests need managing, and if you don't manage them, what you get is often forest fires, especially with the climate warming as it is. So ideally, what we would do is you know, manage those forests in a sustainable way, use the timber to engineer, highly engineered, um, pieces of timber such as CLT to build on one hand small houses and on the other hand you know large 20 15 20 story buildings um, so what this does is reduces the need for things like concrete and steel um, so the more need we create for this type of engineered timber the more need we create for large sustainable forests across the globe so we think that you know we create the industry, we create the need for the product, and in doing so, we grow more and more forests across the globe. And not only does this help deliver lots of building products, it also helps increase biodiversity and all kinds of other um, benefits to having more forests. So what this slide really says is I'm, I'm going to go through a couple of stats now, which sort of maybe slightly different variations on the first presentation that we saw today, but it's approximately estimated that 10% of all carbon emitted through construction is, is via cement basically, cement and concrete. Um, so when you put this in context, you say, well, by 2020, we probably need to build another million houses. Now, using traditional construction techniques, 
this would mean that we need to emit, rather than try to reduce the amount of carbon that we emit as a, as a population in, in this country, we'd actually be, just to deliver the houses that we need in the next few years, we're going to be emitting you know, a hell of a lot of, tim, uh, of carbon. So what we can start to think about is this carbon cycle and say, well, forests grow and, uh, and absorb carbon. We, we manage the forests, we, we build um, highly engineered bits of timber to build you know, all the buildings that we need or some of the buildings that we need. Once the buildings have reached their lifespan, they can be disassembled and used again, the pieces used again, or simply taken to produce and burnt to produce electricity, which is then reabsorbed by the forests that we've replanted having cut down, having cut them down in the first place. And what this slide shows is just you know, the actual process of, of turning a tree into a, uh, into a piece of building material that can be taken to a site. And what it shows is that every part of that tree is used in one way or another. Now, this is an interesting slide because what it shows is that when you first build a building, the energy, the energy uh, sort of consumed by that building is pretty much 100% embodied energy, which is this whereas hardly any of the energy, because a building has not been there for a long time, is energy used by operation. So what you see is by 2035, where we need to um, reduce our carbon to meet the Paris Accord, what we see is that actually, we're gonna, if we don't deal with embodied energy, we're never going to meet the Paris Accord. Um, so what that means is that embodied energy needs to be brought into our legislation in one way or another. And current... Currently, it's not, so that, that really needs to be a priority. So why is this important in the UK? Um, as you can see, we need to build a lot of houses in the UK, and currently, we, we're not building houses as much as we need to in the UK because, uh, for, for various reasons, uh, mainly because by building it, we don't have the, the workforce or, or the staff to, or, or the materials to build in a, in a sort of traditional sense. So, um, you know, Firstly, if we start to think, uh, add Brexit into the mix as well, then not only do we lose lots of architects, we also lose a lot of um, the potential for workers in the future to come over and sort of build all the houses that we need um, and all the, erect all the concrete frames, all, all these kind of traditional methods of construction which take a lot of people to, to, um, to, to work. So why is CLT the answer to that? Well, you know, we reduce our reliance on traditional trades for a start. The whole process of building a cross-laminated timber building means that it's exceptionally quiet uh, and clean compared to, say, a concrete or a steel building. So what it means is that you, you, know, you have happier neighbours, less noise pollution, all these issues. Um, you reduce the sort of length of the project significantly given that lots of the materials are built off-site. Um, and, and all in all, we think that it's a great solution to the, the progression of the construction industry and the, the overall reduction of carbon. So the story so far. So one of the first buildings, that, uh, major buildings that Walthison did um, was Murray Grove. Now this is a sort of 29 unit residential building which was erected in 49 weeks, finished in 2007. So as you can see, the, the red lines on the plans there and the section represent solid bits of timber cross laminated timber construction so as you can see it's sort of the walls and floors are built as a sort of flat pack uh, and it forms a sort of honeycomb type structure and these are a few views of the site now interestingly when you turn up on a site like this it doesn't really feel like a building site as such it's sort of it smells like a pine forest um, and you know all the noise and the dampness you, you know it, you can see that for instance um, these little things hanging down here are to support all the electricians' cables. And rather than, when we spoke to the electricians on this project, rather than arriving on a site and having to have somebody just constantly drilling uh, into a concrete frame, uh, you basically all need, all, all the operatives need is a little hand drill and they, you know, it makes their work so much quicker. Um, so all of the subcontractors, you know, we, we learn on this project that actually they prefer working on these kind of sites. Now, what you'll also notice here is that whilst cross-laminated timber is quite a sophisticated product in itself, the way it's erected is that it's fairly straightforward. It's just bracketed together um, with metal brackets. And this was erected in a matter of weeks with four, four guys from Austria came over with the, with the product itself and erected the building in like a matter of weeks. 
Um, and he, here's a, I, mean, I think the main thing this image shows is that the, the lift cores can also be built in cross laminated timber. So you don't need to even rely on like a, a concrete core to, you know, to deliver the stiffness required in these kind of structures. Um, so all of the things we learned in this project um, sort of came to fruition in, in this pro uh, a few years later in our Dolson Lane scheme. Now, whilst this is not the tallest CLT building, it's by mass, it's the biggest cross-laminated structural timber building in the world, we think. Um, so this is a great example of how the sort of commercial constraints of a project can actually um, be answered by a sort of innovative construction techniques. So there's a site there in Dalston. Um, so there's a sort um, Dalston, Dalston Lane Station is just about down here. And you can see all these coloured lines underneath the site represent various tunnels and various train lines. So one of the major constraints here was that we couldn't pile into the train lines or the future potential train lines. So what we had to do was come up with a solution that allowed for this sort of raft foundation arrangement. So by replacing the concrete frame with a cross-laminated timber frame, what it meant was that we drastically reduced the weight of the building, meaning that we didn't need any, any piles effectively. So th I think in this case, this was a 500 mil deep concrete raft and this one was 900 mil. So extremely efficient, lightweight structure. M it really made this site more viable to the client, uh, to the commercial developer. And then this is a sort of typical section through the, some of the courtyards and you can see that the bits highlighted are filled in in black, actually, they represent solid concrete. So what we normally do with cross-laminated timber buildings is build a concrete podium up to first or second floor. Um, and there's a few reasons for this. I mean, we could build timber right down to the ground, but again, when you're working in a commercial context, it's almost a negotiation. You know, the, the, the contractor has ground workers on site building the foundations. It makes sense while the timber's being procured for them to keep going to first floor level. And also it expands, it allows us to sort of expand the span at ground floor level. So for instance, we can put commercial offices and whatnot with, that, that require larger spans than the residential above. Um, and this is a sort of typical, a typical floor plan of the residential part of the building. So you can see that the, for a residential development, there's no restrictions on the kind of layouts, which often say with a volumetric modular type construction, there's this idea that all of the plans have to be the same, quite boring sort of layouts. Whereas with cross-laminated timber construction, it's um, extremely flexible. Now th this is an interesting image because um, th this discussion which we're constantly having in the office is when we build buildings with lightweight timber frames, philosophically doesn't really make sense to clad it in masonry. It's a, it's a strange idea, but in this context, the, the biggest risk for the project was the planning process. So the developer saw that by cladding the building in bricks, that was a sort of de-risk that process. So what we did here was show that with off-the-shelf products, we could deliver a cross-laminated timber building, sequestering you know, a, a great deal of carbon, but simply clad it in bricks. We could make that work and, and also, there's something to be said about the sort of architecture of the building. You know, it, it's contextual within its area, within a Victorian, predominantly brick Victorian neighbourhood. Um, this image demonstrates the sort of accuracy of cross laminated timber construction. So you can see there that that's all installed as a, a little line of mastic. Just you know, the air tightness in these kind of buildings is is really really good. And that's taken from the underside, uh, the bottom of a lift shaft actually, and you can see these huge brackets here. So the, when you build a cross laminated timber building, it's actually harder to hold it down than it is to hold it up. So you need these huge brackets at the, where the timber connects to the, uh, to, the, to the concrete plinth. And I'm not sure what this guy's looking at, but I think there's a piece of timber being winched in here. <laughs> um, yeah. And then this sequence shows so our first project, the Murray Grove project, is effectively occupies that sort of size in relation. So you, you really get a feel for the scale of this project. So as a summary, what you can see is that by building a, a building with a lightweight frame, we've achieved like way more apartments, way more flats to the commercial developer than they would have been able to get had it been a concrete frame. We've reduced deliveries by, we estimate, 80%, which means much happier neighbors, much quieter area. Um, and then the other question we always get is, well, 
surely we shouldn't be cutting trees down in a time when we're trying to save, you know, reduce carbon. But actually, if you take this, the timber used in this building as a sort of factor of the whole forest that it was taken from in Austria, you could say that that timber only takes three hours to grow. So by thinking about this as a, a you know, a new economy, a new sort of timber economy across, across Europe and maybe even the world, you know, it really is a, a viable option. And then there's the final scheme with the uh, overground just there. So the, the other thing, the other battle we often face is people often say, well, why don't you expose the timber that, that, that you design? Surely you want to show this timber, the, you know, this amazing structural product. And actually, the, rather jokingly, the, the contractor on this project said, well, how, how the hell are we going to sell 120 saunas in Dalston? And we said, well, this really demonstrates that you know, this looks, for all intents and purposes, like a normal new build residential flat. Um, so we can do that. We demonstrated that we can do that. But on the lower levels here, you know, we can expose the timber um, and in achieve bigger spans in the sort of commercial parts of the building. How, how are we doing for time? Good. Good? All right, great. Okay, so I can drag on a bit longer. Um, so... What's the next step? So we've used cross-laminated timber to, you know, build several large significant schemes in London. And what's the next step? There's a lot of people talking about MMC, modular construction, all kinds of things. So if you look at the farming industry, it's changed drastically over the past hundred years or so. Same as the healthcare industry. The automotive industry is always used as an example in construction. Um, but then... The, <laughs> The construction industry hasn't really changed in, in a significant way as the other industries that we just looked at. So here's a picture of, you know, um, ha cross laminated timber is not only good for um, building buildings in, in pure cross laminated timber, it, it's also starting to form um, products uh, in the sort of MMC world. So, for instance, you can, you can get modular construction, which is the modules are all built of cross laminated timber or you can get sort of um, hybrid type structures where certain parts of the building are built in cross laminated timber and, and, and other methods are adopted. So the idea here is about, you know, repeating the process rather than, you know, when you talk about modular construction, this is the first thing many people think of, this kind of repetitive, boring, oppressive architecture. Um, you know, the, the idea of comparing the, the car industry, it's about how you scale your, um, how do you scale your, your model of repetition and what is appropriate for each different project? So you can see that um, Mitsubishi have one chassis that effectively means you can put the same car, uh, same car with different shells to create 14 different cars based on one chassis. So they have their sort of module of repetition sorted out. But what we have to decide for each project is, do we need to... Do we want to build full modular apartments where each apartment is built in a factory and delivered in a truck? Or do we want to build houses and apartments that are built of the same wall units, for instance? Or do we want to build something that is sort of traditional, but, you know, for instance, the bathroom pods are the thing that is multiplied. So what, what we have to really get to grips with is what that module of repetition is. Um, and it's very flexible. It's not as... Um, restrained as you might. It doesn't always have to affect the architecture in the way that people sometimes think. So this is um, a project that we did for the London Festival of Architecture. Um, it's a pavilion that was in the Sackler Courtyard at the v &A, and this is actually the first piece of CLT that was um, built in this country. Um, the timber used here is actually an American hardwood uh, and you can see that what we've done is sort of all the all, all these uh, sort of planks uh, pieces of timber that are about three by three meters have been CNC cut to you know, millimeter tolerances and uh, a system has been designed, a system of connecting them so it means that they can be taken apart and put back together you know, as many times as need be really. And there you can see a picture of it in the Sackler Courtyard um, and what it is is effectively a, a 3D maze. Um, admittedly it's a pavilion but it's aimed at demonstrating you know, the, the, the limits or, or you know, demonstrating the benefits of this type of construction. And then, just to show that this thing could be taken apart, it, it went to Milan, and it had a slightly different location there. Um, we've also got a, 
a full modular project actually with Swan Living, where and they have a factory in London, and we've. Um, this is a project we have where it's full modular construction. So these boxes, you can see each one. I think there's about 15 different different types, but um, they're, they're, they're CLT boxes, cross laminated timber boxes. And the reason why this works well for modular construction is often the issue with modular construction is not really the structure of the building once the modules are in place. It's lifting the modules up and down and getting them into place. So they need to have a certain rigidity and often that means they need to be more structural. They need to be over, over designed in order to be lifted around. So what this project really, coming back to the idea of this presentation, what this really shows is that, oh, there's one on the back of a truck. It really shows that you can do a modular project where the architecture isn't, isn't affected. Uh, you can still design a sort of contextual building that, that doesn't you know, show where the joints between the modules are. And this question of cladding has come back in this project because we've been pushing to, to clad this building in a sort of uh, a clay tile, which is, I suppose, effectively a brick slip, or the thickness of a brick slip, but it's actually a tile. So it has a similar texture to the sort of surrounding brick buildings, yet it's a fraction of the weight. So philosophically, it makes more sense for us to design a building like that. I'm not sure where we got with this argument because um, I, I think that the developer wants to turn it to brick, but you know, we're fighting that battle and we, we, we're trying to keep going with that. Um, and then, slightly different type of project. Um, we, designed, we designed a factory for Vitsu and Vitsu bought the rights to the Dieter Rams um, shelving system that was designed in the 1960s. And th this obviously is like a gorgeous shelving system. And the, the sort of idea behind this was that it was very, it was, highly designed, millimeter perfect, and it was designed to sort of, you, you buy it and you can buy all the additional parts if anything breaks. And the idea is that the people you buy it from come and install it, and then when you move house, they come and take it down and rebuild it in your new house. And every time you want to expand it, it's a sort of modular process. So th that was the sort of philosophy behind that. So what the client wanted to do here was to build a factory which took the same ideas on board. So you can see that the sort of, the design of the building takes on that sort of vernacular idea of a north factory with north lights, and each of these is a sort of bay at 25 metres by 10 metres, I think, and the idea being that it can be expanded as the factory grows or, or, or reduced if, if needs be. Um, and this is a really interesting photo because the whole thing has been designed um, to allow it to change as it needs to. So these beams here, the, these are actually um, called LVL beams, and that's essentially um, lumber veneer vinyl, uh, lumber veneer timber actually, which is essentially hardwood, a, a glue lamb beam, a hardwood glue lamb beam. So you can see they're used here, and they, the span between here and here is about 15 meters, and then the overall span is 25 meters. And the end of these beams here have Sherpa connections, which allow it, the beams to fit into these gaps here should they need to put more floor space into, into the building. So every single design step was intended to you know, move with the needs of the client. There's a nice shot of the north lights. Um, I'm just gonna run through these now. This, just, um, this is one of the commercial projects that we've built. Um, it's on site now. This is a CGI, it's not quite finished. Um, but this is actually a commercial office building and again, it's it's in an urban location. It's in Dalston. It's on the on the Regents Canal, um, and you can see here that we've adopted a sort of a metal frame, a steel frame, with infill CLT slabs. Now that wouldn't have been our first preference in terms of what we wanted to do as a um, as as architects interested in designing timber, but actually again it was part of this negotiation of trying our hardest to get as much embodied. Um, to reduce the embodied energy as much as we could, and this is where we ended up. Um, if we'd have, if we'd have done this in um, a glue lamp beams, it meant the span the, the beams would have been too deep to to build. We would have had to have get rid of that story. So it ended up being a sort of bespoke steel and, and timber solution. Um, yeah, a view over the city. And then just finally to end on our. Um, our bushy project, um, and actually, whilst we talk about 
timber the whole time and we're really interested in designing buildings in timber you know this is one of the projects that i think has been in the office for about 10 years for such a small project you can imagine that that you know it, it's a labor of love so these kind of projects are the ones we use as a test bed to test different types of technology um and the idea here was that um the, basically the building is uh, a Jewish cemetery and there's two quite big prayer halls and it was built in the green belt and the idea was that every six, uh, 50 years I think that they have to build a new prayer hall demolish the old one and move it in order that they get planning permission to build in the green belt so the idea here was that we built it in rammed earth which when it needed to be moved it could just be demolished and put back into the earth effectively which was a nice analogy um, given that it's um, a cemetery and you can see that the sort of the feeling of the space there when you go in it the walls hold the cool uh, of the site when you go in there it's incredibly nice and cool the acoustics are really nice and calm um, and and that sort of brings it full circle around to our, our our interest as architects is in timber but you know we aspire to do the most sustainable buildings the you know the most the, the lowest energy that buildings that we can um, but obviously the architecture is still foremost important to us there you go and you can yeah